Um, it is tough because it's not easy to um, interpret or make sense of. Uh, but it is a very important passage in the Bible. Uh, what you are going to read right now with me is, uh, is this passage is actually referred to several times in other parts of the Bible. Uh, most closely uh, in chapter 27 of Numbers where uh, there's an uh, announcement of why Moses could not enter into Canaan. And then Psalm 106 talks about this event. Uh, and then uh, there are a few other Psalms that refer to it, um, uh, but you're not really sure whether they're referring to this event or another event that I will share with you, Exodus chapter 17. Uh, but also in the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is uh, essentially made up of three sermons by Moses. Okay? It's a sermon by Moses, three sermons. And in those sermons, Moses talk about this event at least three times uh, with a lot of uh, regret and uh, uh, even disappointments. So this is not an event that only, only shown in this passage, but it's an event that recurs in reference form in other parts of the Bible. And you, you could you could figure out that this is a pretty, pretty, pretty important thing. So anyway, so what I'm going to do is start reading from verse 2. This is about um, what happened at a place now later named as Meribah. Now there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines or uh, palm grenades, and there is no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron, your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So they shall bring water, so you shall bring water out of the rock for them, and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from the Lord, uh, from before the Lord, as he commanded him. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their livestock. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the, Lord, eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the, the Lord. Through them, he showed himself holy. Um, it's a difficult passage because um, it is not entirely easy to figure out why God was upset with Moses and Aaron. They were faithful leaders for a number of years, and uh, this particular incident is constantly referred back as a reason why they were not allowed to go into Canaan. And, and that's, that's, a, that's a pretty serious thing, isn't it? Moses led the people of Israel for 40 years, and he gave everything. He gave all. 
But at the end of his career, you know, you thought or you think that God would at least allow him to, to get inside Canaan and be buried there. But God would not allow that. God would have him stop at the very edge of the desert. And he would die only seeing the good land of Canaan, but not actually stepping into it. And constantly it is said it's because of this incident. They were not allowed, him and Aaron. Well, uh, this is the incident of Meribah. And uh, Meribah means quarreling, fighting. So uh, you get that word from what happened, that people were quarreling with Moses and also people were quarreling with God, as it says in verse 13. But the Meribah incident here is not the origin of the name Meribah. In fact, it's a name that was given to that same place years and years and years ago as the incident appears in chapter 17 of book of Exodus. The difference between the first incident, Exodus 17, and this incident, uh, there are a couple of differences, and I will share that with you. But anyway, the first incident happened uh, shortly shortly after they left Egypt. So this, this actually, this, this place called Meribah is, is uh, near the Mount Horeb, and, and it's a place uh, that they've arrived after they made a brief sojourn out of Egypt into the wilderness, right? Um, and in that particular moment, people are thirsting for water, and, and you could guess that Wilderness life, wilderness essentially like desert, a uh, rough place. You have two problems. One, uh, among many other problems, I'm sure, but among many other, there are two problems. One, food. Where are you going to get food for these, all these people, million plus people? I mean, it's just amazing that this could even happen. Second big problem is water. Um, and I would say drinking water is probably more essential than even food. I mean, you can't survive without water very long. Uh, chapter 17 talks about the bringing of water by God's miraculous provision. Chapter 16, right before that, talks about God giving manna from heaven. And manna is the, the food that people were given for 40 years to eat in the desert miraculously. So they go together. So it was the manna that God gave, and then there was water that, that God gave. And how did God give water to them? So if you go to chapter 17 of Exodus, they're very similar. People are curling against Moses and complaining, why have you brought us out here to die of thirst? And God directs Moses to uh, find this particular rock. And I'm going to read this passage for you. Verse 6, just one verse. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah. So you see what God did. God said, look, I'm going to show you a particular rock. In fact, I'm not just going to show you. I'm going to stand on top of that rock. God appeared in, in a particular form. It's, it's very difficult to figure out exactly what it, what it looked like. But, but what's clear is that God said, I'm going to be on that rock. When I stand on that rock, I want to strike that rock. Isn't that curious? Isn't that interesting? So what is God doing? God is essentially identifying himself with that rock. Okay, God is not the rock. The rock is not God. But what happens there is that that rock becomes sacramentally related to God. Sacramentally meaning symbolically the rock becomes God in a sense. The rock refers to God. God stands on the rock. He identifies with the rock. And when Moses strikes down the, at the rock, you could assume that it is God who is getting struck by the, by, the, by the staff because God's standing there on the rock. But God did this for a very good reason. God did this as a preview of what he's going to do. Okay? He's going to give water, a living water to the people. And in order to do that, God will stand and God will be struck. And you know what that is. It's, it's about Jesus Christ on the cross 
And when Christ was struck, out of him came water and blood, living water that flowed forever and ever. And this rock cracked open, and then out of that rock came gushing out water. Just, just refreshing water came out of the rock, and people were able to drink it. That's the first incident. It's, it's a reference to Christ. It's a reference to what God would do for His people. God would give out water as He Himself is the originator of this water. It's not a magic rock. It is God. Okay? And Paul, and I, I, this is something I mentioned when I preached on, on the Gospel of John, Paul actually takes that particular incident and says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, he says, that rock was a spiritual rock. That rock was not just any rock, but that rock had a meaning, spiritual meaning, and that is the rock that followed the people of Israel for 40 years. Very curious statement again. But that was the legend. There was a, there was a legend among the, the Jews, the, the Israelites, that that it wasn't as if everywhere they went for 40 years, they have to look for a new rock. They had to look for a new source of water. But it is that same rock that was cracked at Meribah. That, that rock out of which God poured out water out of himself. That same rock is the rock that followed Israel for 40 years. And God gave them water to drink. And Paul says right there, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4, he says, it is Christ Jesus. So again, it's a, it's a very sacramental. It's that rock represents Jesus in a way that when we do the baptism, baptism represents the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ applied to us. Sacrament. The water of baptism itself is just water, but out of that water baptism comes the meaning of us being connected to Jesus. Same with the Lord's Supper, the bread and wine. Just regular bread, regular Welch's grape juice. But you take them and you identify them with Jesus sacramentally. They are just what they are. But as we take them, we are connected to with Jesus. That's exactly what's happening to the rock. Okay? So we come to this story now in chapter 20 of Book of, uh, Book of Numbers. And how is this story different from the first one? Well, first, it's the time difference. You will note, if you are meditating along the daily Bible, that chapter 20 is a significant chapter because two very important people die in this chapter. In verse 1, Miriam dies. Miriam is sister of Moses and Aaron. And she was an important prophetess, and she played a very important role in this whole Exodus community, and she dies, which means that a significant amount of time had passed. And then at the end of chapter 20, Aaron, the brother of Moses, the high priest, dies. So this story is stuck in between the story of the death narratives, right? So two people die, two important people, and this story is somehow narrated in between that to, to refer to the fact that, that this story comes at the end, almost at the end of the journey, end of the journey. I find it very curious that the people are complaining exactly like their fathers did. People haven't changed that much. God declared that first generation of Exodus people shall die in the desert, but their children will enter in. Anyone under 20 will enter in. But everyone over 20, when they came out of Egypt, they will all die in the desert, except for Joshua and Caleb. So symbolically, this is a this is a very meaningful thing, that our old self must die and our new self being born in the Spirit uh, in Jesus Christ, uh, after Jesus Christ, we shall live. So it's a very symbolically well put together scenario, but you find that the new generation is just as rebellious as the first generation. I mean, I'm alarmed by this, uh, which means that 
even though God does new things, even though a new generation comes, one thing that we should never forget is that what we observe from our parents, the kind of attitudes, kind of spiritual disposition that you see in your parents, they don't disappear very quickly, unfortunately. Children oftentimes simply repeat what they have heard, what they have seen from the earlier generation. But the key to understanding today's passage is, even though that may be true, God's intention is to keep His promise. God said, I will bring the new generation into the land of Canaan. Yes, they are just as rebellious as their parents' generation. But God says, I will take you into Canaan. On the other hand, even as great people as they are, Moses and Aaron, are, are declared by God in this passage as having no faith. God decidedly identified them with the first generation. You've done a hard work, I understand, but this, what you just did, shows me that you have not shown me faith. It shows me that you have no faith. And as a result, God says, you shall not enter into the land of Canaan. So this is in the mind of God. God already have this, this declaration of uh, his plan. His plan is one generation will perish, new generation will enter into Canaan. And it's not because the Israelites are particularly more obedient at this stage, even though they were just as rebellious because of God's heart for them. God's declared will for them. Instead of accusing the Israelites of lacking faith, God says it's Moses and Aaron who has no faith, who have no faith. And they're the ones who do not enter into Canaan, not the younger generation. A lot to think about. Well, uh, what happened in this passage? In the first uh, um, story, Exodus chapter 17, very similar to this one, but there God told Moses to strike the rock. Here God says simply to speak to it. God tells Moses to carry a staff, but that staff was not to be used as a means to hit the rock. But in this case, Moses simply does what he wants to do. He doesn't speak to the rock. Rather, he gets angry at the people. And then he takes the staff and he hits the rock. It says he hit it twice. Whenever you have a very specific number, that means there is an emphasis there. There's an emphasis. He did it even though he wasn't told to do. And God looked at that incident and said, here's a problem. Okay, brothers and sisters, what are the problems? What are the problems? Okay, here, God says, verse 12, And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring the assembly into the land that I have given them. I give the land to them, but you shall not bring them, because you did not uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel. So one reason given is that they had not given, they had not upheld the holiness of God. Okay? But I'm going to talk about one more passage in chapter 27, and I'll just tell you what it says. It's the same story being narrated, not exactly the same amount, but in a short place, there's a, there's, a, there's a restatement of why God would not allow Moses to go into the land of Canaan. And there it is said, because you disobeyed me. And as such, you did not uphold, upheld my holiness before the eyes of the people. So you have the repetition of that phrase. You did not, rep you did not uphold my holiness before the people. But there's one extra statement there. You did not obey me. You did not obey me. So let's, let's go through this. 
I'm just going to talk about these two. You did not obey me. That's the problem. Number two, you did not uphold me as holy before Israel. In what sense did, 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 not, uh, did Moses and Aaron disobey God? In what sense? Um, God said clearly, it's the rock, okay? That rock, I want to speak to it. It's the rock. Which rock is it? It's the rock of Meribah. It's the same rock that was struck years and years and years ago, out of which God gave water. And if we take Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, seriously, it means it's, the, it's that rock that out of which God occasionally gave water. One hint we get out of this is that that rock, even though it's the rock out of which God gave water for 40 years to the people, it isn't as if the water was constantly flowing. It wasn't a constantly flowing river. It was a rock. Then whenever God wants to give water to the people, God would let the water come out of this rock. It's a rock with personality. <laughs> you know, it's not that rock itself had a personality, but that rock was not automatic. It wasn't, it wasn't that just whenever people want, water came out. Or whenever people went to tap it, water came out. No, it was the rock out of which God, out of His intention, gave water when the people needed water or when God desired to give them water. You know, in this sense, I think this is very similar to what God said through Moses about the time that they will spend in the land of Canaan. When you enter into Canaan, the, the Canaanite land is not like the land of Egypt, where you could pretty much bring the water out of the river Nile because Nile, you know, rarely dried up. It, it was a big river. But in the land of Israel, in Canaan, there's no such river. Jordan River, just a little trickling uh, uh, body of water between um, two lakes, and, and it's, it's inside a, uh, a valley, and it's impossible to bring that water out into the plain to do any kind of agricultural activity. So God said, God said, look, the land of Canaan is a place that you need my constant watching care. I am not going to put you where you could do whatever and no consequence. I'm going to put you in a place where I need to constantly care for you. You need to constantly have fellowship with me. You need to ask me and I will give. Because it's the land that requires Rain at the proper time. So God phrases early rain and late rain. You need rain after the winter to break the hard ground. And also after you sow the seeds, you need rain to make that seeds, those seeds grow, sprout and grow. So God said, you need my care. And God said, I will discipline you through this water. Very similar, I think, with what's going on with the rock here. It's not like there's a constant flowing, but what God wants with the people is not some automatic service. God is not a vending machine. I, I think he refused to be that. You know, God is a person. God is somebody whom you deal with as a personality. He's not a machine. He's not a thing. You don't simply tap onto God whenever you need something. God is the one whom you have fellowship with constantly. That's what God wants. That's what this rock was. And God told Moses, Moses, simply speak to it, and the water shall gush out of that rock and will quench the thirst of the people. But instead of doing that, Moses became angry. And he decided to use the rock as a way of getting even with the people. Look at what Moses says. Moses said, verse 10, Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, Shall we bring water for you out of this rock? What is he doing? He's, he's getting very angry at people, and he's saying, You rebels! You are the ones who are giving me a hard time. You're rebelling against me. And the next statement, he says, Shall we give you water out, out of this rock? What do you think he's saying? 
I wish I was able to, you know, hear the actual tone and understand what he's saying, but, you know, to some people, it sounds like he's boasting. I could give you water if I want. Uh, but to me, it, it sounds more like him angry and saying, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. Here now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? It's as if he has the control. He's the one who's holding the control of this rock. And he's saying, shall I give it to you? No, I don't want to give it to you. You, know, you have that, that clear nuance here, I think. He's telling to the people, you rebels, I, I hate you for all that you've done. And I don't want to give this water to you. And out of anger, on the other hand, because God said, do it. Instead of speaking gentle words to the rock, he took his, rock, his, his staff and violently struck the rock twice. Struck the rock twice. Problem. By speaking this way, I think what he has done is he has reduced the heart of grace of God that he wanted to communicate to the people. God promised these people, I will bring you to Canaan. God had already said in his mind to give them water to drink and for, the, for them and the cattle. God is generous to give them what they need. Yes, they're faithless, but God promised to spare them, and God would give them. The heart of God's grace the heart of God's mercy, the heart of God's love. Unimaginable, unimaginable, isn't it? As Romans said in chapter 5, while we were still weak, Christ came and died for us. While we were still sinning, Christ gave and he gave, came and gave his life for us. While we were still enemies of God, God sent his son to die for us. Not because we deserve it, not because we are great, but because God promised, God promised that he will send his son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation so that we shall be quenched of our thirst. God said, I will do it despite your weakness, despite your sinfulness, despite you being enemies of God still. God says, I send my son to you. This is my heart. Heart of mercy, heart of God's grace, heart of God's goodness. God has already determined for this generation, you shall enter into Canaan. That is my will. I show you my grace. You're thirsty. You're dying of thirst. I shall give you water. And at that very moment, Moses stands in front of the people in behalf of God, so to speak. And he says, I don't want to give you water. You rebels, I condemn you. I don't want to do this. What, have he, what has he done? He has reduced the very heart of God as something very small and tiny. God became a very stingy God. God became some, someone who just give a little drop here, a little drop there. When God's heart is, I pour myself out to you. That's what Moses did. Number two, I think what Moses did is that he exaggerated his role in this by taking the staff and hitting the rock twice and said, I give you this water. Disobedience. He exaggerated his role. He thinks that it's something about him. Remember I said it's about sacramental meaning of the rock. Rock is sacramental. What Moses is doing is sacramental. It's not Moses who gives water. It is God who gives water. It is God who gives grace, not Moses. But Moses acted as if that he had a big part in this. That it is because he hit the rock somehow in his magical, magical way that somehow people are able to drink the water. And God looked at it and God was very, very unhappy with it. Again, you know, when you have sacraments, it doesn't matter. You know, what kind of matzah or what kind of grape juice you use. I mean, you just want to be very discreet about it. 
You know, you don't want to offer people that taste really awful or something like that. So everybody will remember nothing but the bad taste. You don't want to do that. But important thing is dispensing of the grace of Jesus Christ through the sacramental medium. Baptism is baptism. It is a reference to the death and the resurrection of Jesus and how we identify ourselves with that. It doesn't really matter what water. What water? I don't know how many of you were baptized by the water from River Jordan. You're, you're wondering, what do you mean by that? See, there was this fashionable thing for a number of years. I saw that. I, I didn't get that, but I, I saw that a lot of pastors would make a trip to Israel. And, and they would go to Israel and they actually put the dirty water from the River Jordan, uh, where apparently 2,000 years ago, Jesus himself was baptized. So they, they take the dirty water from River Jordan in a bottle, and it really looked dirty, by the way, and they brought that back to church and said, you know what, next baptism, I'm going to use this water directly imported from River Jordan. And people said, wow. I get to get baptized by the Jordan water, River Jordan, water from River Jordan. But to, be, but to be very clear about it, that has nothing to do with it. It doesn't matter whether it's a great tap water from the city of Philadelphia or Deer Park purified water. It doesn't really matter. Whatever it is, the important thing is that it is a sacramentally connected to Jesus Christ. It's about Jesus. In the early church days, there was a controversy about the validity of baptism given by pastors, ministers, who defected from faith, who were apostates. What does that mean? Well, persecutions came. Their lives were threatened. And as serious the persecutions came in the Roman Empire, certain clergymen or certain ministers couldn't hold their faith. They were too afraid for their lives. And they said, I denounce Christ. You know, after the, the persecution swept through the land, a peaceful time comes. Church is being restored. And the big question is, if you were baptized by these ministers who, who, who apostatized, these ministers who, who lost faith in Christ, these people who said that under persecution, I do not believe in Jesus anymore, are those baptisms valid or do you need to be rebaptized? There was, a, uh, there was a different opinions about it. Half the people said those baptisms are invalid because it was offered by the people who were not genuine Christians, turns out. And the other half said, no, 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 no. Baptism is still baptism. It's valid because the baptism was done according to the confession of faith and it was done in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the triune God. It is very important to study church history because a lot of the issues that are recurring in the later times already explored in the earlier days by faithful men and women. The conclusion then was the orthodox way, the right way, the true way is to receive the baptism as valid regardless of who gave that baptism. Why? Because baptism was a sacrament. You know, it doesn't matter if your baptism was given by me or someone else or some famous, famous pastor, you know. You may consider that as something to cherish in your mind. You know, I was baptized by this great pastor that I used to know. But the truth is, it doesn't really matter who baptized you. The important thing is the baptism itself because that's a sacramental relationship to Jesus Christ. Moses missed it. Moses thought that it was him. Moses thought that it was him. He was so angry. 
Psalm 106 that talks about this incident says, people made the heart of Moses bitter. And as such, Moses spoke rashly. Moses spoke rashly to the people. The word there is rashly, but it actually means unwisely, foolishly. Moses spoke foolishly. He spoke. He lost control. He lost balance. And he spoke in a way that did not obey God. Okay, I'm going to conclude with the following statement, the following point. That is, then God said, you did not uphold my holiness. You did not uphold my holiness. That's the problem. You did not uphold my holiness. So the big question that we have to get to and understand is, what is the holiness of God? What do we mean when we say God is holy? The word holiness means being separate. Okay? Holiness, separateness. To be holy is to be separate. That means God is distinct. God is separate from all the other. God is God. Only God is God. There's no other God. God is holy. God is the only one who is God. So when God said, you did not uphold my holiness, it means that you did not show forth the fact that I am God. I am it. I am the only God, and this is how I am. What you've done in front of the people is that you demonstrated to them which is not God. You said, God is like this, when God is really not like that. You have failed to communicate me as me. You did not convey me, my heart, accurately as that which is truly God's. You have failed to show forth my holiness. I think this is so important. What God is saying is, hey, you need to know my heart. You need to know what I am. You need to know what I am intending to do. You know, don't go out there and misrepresent me. Don't go out there and tell people that which is not God, about God and say this is what God said. One thing that God will not compromise is God will never compromise who he is. You can't go around telling people this is what God said when it's not what God said. God said, do not use my name in vain. Do not fail to uphold my holiness. Don't you get really upset when somebody takes your word, twists it, and tells somebody else something different? And said, Pastor Steve said it. You get very upset. Why? Because you're misrepresented. You didn't say that. That wasn't your intention. But people believe that that's your intention. And then you have to go explain, no, it's not my intention. You know, I, yesterday, even in a meeting, um, one, one staff said, you know, so-and-so said so-and-so was very upset about something, something, right? So I heard that, and I initially responded by saying, well, there's no reason why that person should be, you know, offended or be disappointed, uh, because it, it's his fault or it's her fault. You know, why, why, is, why are they complaining? So my instant response to that was, they're wrong. And then, then came the more so, sober thought into my head. Well, maybe it's not what he or she said. Maybe it's the way that it was conveyed by that middle person. Maybe it was somebody else who twisted it. So therefore, you need to go and investigate. Make sure what's going on in that person's heart. That's fair, isn't it? So when you have relationship issues, a lot of it is what people said. You know, don't go around saying things about people as if you know everything about them, unless you really know them. I mean, even about your parents or even your children, even about your spouse. It's not easy to, to always say it fairly. But what's more important is being fair in terms of what God is and what God wants and what God does. God wanted to show His holiness. God wanted to show to the people of Israel that I am God. I promised you the land of Canaan, and I will give you the land of Canaan. I will not let you die here out of thirst. 
It is my intention that regardless of your faithlessness, I am going to give you water to drink. I don't want Moses to go out there and say, no, 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 no. God wants to give you just a little drop here, a little drop there. God wants to be very stingy because God's upset at you. Or God needs me to do his work. You did not uphold my holiness. You know, this passage concludes rather curiously in verse 13 by saying, he showed himself holy. Well, didn't he just say Moses failed to show God's holiness? He did. But then at the end of the day, the end of the story, God showed his holiness. God showed that he is God. By what? Even though Moses did this out of his rashness, out of his foolishness, we are told water came out abundantly from the rock and people drank. Not because Moses hit the rock twice. Not because Moses did anything right, but because God was gracious to give them abundant water. God showed himself to be God despite disobedience of the people. You know, this morning as we conclude our worship, I want us to be really imp be impressed by how good our God is. The only way you really know that is by looking at Jesus. You love Jesus because Jesus is the true mediator. He is the true Moses. He is the true Aaron. What Moses and Aaron had failed to do at the end of the day, Jesus would never fail. Jesus is the very face of God revealed to us. Whenever you doubt about God. Whenever you have issues with God, whenever you are disappointed, for whatever reasons, fix your eyes on Jesus. Look to Him. Look to His face and see the very heart of God. Not because you're faithful, not because you're famous, not because you're smart or well-educated or rich, not because of any of those reasons, but because you are wretched, because you are sinful, because you are weak, you cannot save yourself. But it's at that very moment God sent His Son and God sent His Spirit to each and every one of our hearts. And it is not because of how great we are or how great the people who send you the gospel are, but it's because how great God is. How great Jesus is. We have the gospel. You know, your worship needs to be joyful. Your worship needs to be filled with gratitude. Your life must see the holiness of God. Otherwise, you're missing the point. May the Lord bless us as we look to His holiness and be impressed. Be impressed by Him. Let me ask you all to stand, and at this time, I'm going to ask the Korea mission team to come in. Are they here, Myung? No. Not? Not Nana? Not, 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 not. Okay, that's fine then. That's fine. A little later. But let, let me pray for us as we sing the closing hymn. Father, we thank you for showing us your heart that the waters of Meribah is not the waters of condemnation, but it's the waters of God himself, you yourself being broken for us so that abundant water would flow for us to drink. We do not deserve it, yet through Jesus Christ, you gave us everything that we would ever need. Who are we to tell the world God is this or God is that in a reduced way? You have called the church to be the salt and the light of the world, and oftentimes, just as the Old Testament Israelites have failed to do, we fail to show forth your greatness, your love. Lord, we ask you to forgive us, but cause us to live every day 
so impressed, so amazed by Jesus Christ himself. You are the only one. We turn to you. In Jesus' name, amen.